Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us come before God with thanksgiving. Praise the Lord.
now as one body, let us lift our The Old Testament reading this morning is from Genesis, chapter 45, beginning with the third verse. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, but there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, a lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept among them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Please stand now for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is from Luke chapter 6, beginning with the 27th verse. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. This is the word of God for the people of God. As I continue to grow older, I keep discovering past traumas within my families, particularly my mother's side of the family. About 20 years, a little less than 20 years ago, I was a sophomore in college and our family I went back to South Korea to visit our family and friends. And we used to do this every couple of years. And in this particular trip, my mother and I went to a very rural part of southern part of South Korea, a place where my mother's mother's father uh, lived and raised his family. So it would have been my great-grandfather. It was a 10-year anniversary of my great-grandfather's passing. So an extended family all gathered to honor, to remember, and to celebrate his life. So there were about 30 of us there for about three days. And when we got there, I noticed that there were another 15 to 20 folks waiting for us there. I thought, well, good, uh, family, friends, we'll get to spend some time together, get to know one another. Immediately, I knew that there were a lot of contention and, and strife in the ways in which we spoke to one another, how we ate together. Things weren't working out very well. There were a couple of times where people got into verbal outward arguments. And even at times, we're out to get in the ways of people getting into scuffle. And Finally, by day two, my mother informed me, uh, the folks that joined us here are your great-grandfather's second family. So one can only imagine the wounds present, the past brokenness, the two groups of folks who've not seen each other for decades back together trying to make it work, a very difficult and even awkward three days that we spent together. I've not had any uh, opportunity to talk to our pastor of Congregational Care, Bill Roth, about this, but if any of you have had, has, or thinking about having a second family, here's my pastoral advice. Stop it. <laughs> no good can come out of it. I've been in ministry long enough to know that we all have some family matters, some good, some bad, some really bad. And when we examine Joseph's relationship to his father, his brothers, his siblings, his friends and acquaintances, we see the depth of our disconnect, the gap, the brokenness inherent in so much of our relationships to one another. Jacob, Joseph's father, we read, had many wives. 
His favorite wife was Rachel. Rachel's only son was Joseph, Joseph of today's scripture lesson. And it just so happens that other wives had 11, 10 other sons, but Joseph was the youngest, at least for now. Benjamin comes later. We also read about Joseph's special coat. We know growing up in Sunday school about Joseph's tunic. What you may not know is that Joseph received a long sleeve tunic. Short sleeve tunic folks, they're the ones who worked in the field. People who received a long sleeve tunic were the ones who did not work in the field, either managed or stayed home. Uh, that was a coat of honor, typically reserved for the oldest child. But here we see that the youngest son, the favorite son of the favorite wife, Joseph, is the one to receive this special long sleeve tunic. Joseph the youngest, he's not the most likable brother, is he? We read throughout Genesis that he's the one to tattletale on his brothers. Often he's at the field not working, looking at his brothers. When something goes wrong, he goes back home and tells his father about it. But we also know of his dreams, these wild dreams that he has. And not only that, he is foolish enough to tell his family about the dreams, which eventually even upsets his Father, And what's the dream about? The dream is all about his brothers and his parents all submitting themselves one day before the feet of Joseph. So we read that finally the brothers had enough. Uh, they were ready to kill Joseph, but instead they decided to sell, sell him into slavery, which was a huge upgrade to their plan. Yeah? Joseph is sold to Egypt. He ends up at Potiphar's house. And in Potiphar's house, he meets Potiphar's wife, who gets smitten with Joseph. We read that Joseph is a really good-looking man, probably contributed to the envy and jealous of his brothers. Joseph resists, runs away, gets framed anyways, and he ends up in jail. Yet throughout the text, we read over and over again that the Lord was with Joseph. It turns out that being in jail was a good thing because Joseph has a knack to interpret dreams, which came in handy because he's before the Pharaoh to interpret the dream. And we all know about that dream, yes? Seven years of prosperity, seven years of famine. And during the seven years of famine, the brothers come to the land of Egypt from faraway land. Joseph sees them, but they do not recognize Joseph. And for a couple of chapters, Joseph does this weird interplay. You know, he treats them. Um, accuses them of thievery, locks them in jail, and then treats them again into our climactic scene before us today. We read, they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. We often do a couple of things with our enemies in hopes of getting past it. Uh, sometimes we try to forget the past as if nothing really that bad happened to just get moved past it. And other times we misremember what really took place so as to diminish the pain and wounds caused from our traumatic events. But in our story today, Joseph names the wrong committed and he recalls a chain of event that caused so much pain for so many others. Yet, Joseph goes beyond all this, and he makes a surprising move toward reconciliation. We read of an explicit disclosure of identity here. What's the first step in Joseph's move in ways of reconciling? He says, I am your brother, Joseph. I think the biggest problems of possessing our enemies in our lives, one of many issues that we face when we have enemies in our lives, is that often when we have our enemies before us, the lens to which we see them becomes completely binary. It becomes all or nothing, all good, all bad, all just, all evil, and our world becomes black and white. And make no mistake, Joseph brothers are indeed not so very good people. Envy, jealousy, kidnap, deceit, attempted murder, slavery. They check off all the boxes of being the enemy. Yet Joseph somehow, some way, nuances his supposed enemies. Upon gathering them, Joseph identifies himself as their brother. 
And in turn, he identifies those, his enemies, as his brother. And not only that, Joseph speaks to the most powerful and the unifying attribute between himself and his brothers. Did you catch that in the scripture lesson? They share, what's the biggest commonality they share? They share the same father. How is my father? He asks. What happens to Joseph over these years is what we call growth. Yes? Joseph was an arrogant young man. His self-importance angered his brothers so much that they contrived to acts of hatred. But gone is the bratty, self-absorbed dreamer, but instead we see someone who's able to take the next step. John Sanford in The Man Who Wrestled With God, he writes the following, evil remains evil until man's consciousness grow because of it. Then God can use it for good. Joseph came out of the dark night of his soul. From the pit of despair, Joseph rose with newfound wisdom for himself and for those around him, even his enemies. Joseph sees his enemies with new lens, not just as those who've committed wrong against him, but as his brothers, as those with whom he shares the same father. One of my favorite sports movies, probably my favorite football movie, is Remember the Titans. There's a lot of subplots in that movie. One of the storylines is between these two football players, high schoolers, they start as enemies. They hate each other. They can't stand to be in the same room with one another, but eventually, through various trials and tribulations, they become friends. They love one another. And toward the end of the movie, one says to the other, I was afraid of you, Julius. I only saw what I was afraid of. And now I know I was only hating my brother. The truth is, Joseph's experience of being wronged is universal. We all know what it means to be in Joseph's shoes. And in more than occasionally, the Josephs of our world, once they rise to a certain place of position and power, they use that power to pay back those who've wronged them. That is the ways of our world. But here in our story today, revenge is replaced with compassion. Here, the victim does not seek retribution, but instead desires reconciliation. And what an amazing story of reconciliation between father and son, between siblings, between one community to another. Joseph proves willing to let go of the past and to share a new perspective of God in regards to kinship. Reconciliation is not about saving face. It's about vulnerability, which is a risky proposition. But we read today in our scripture lesson that Joseph, in the end, wept and kissed each and every one of his brothers. I read recently that, and this has to be true because it was in National Geographic, <laughs> that we as human beings are the only mammals who can cry due to emotion that we possess the ability to shed tears out of our love, to cry, to cry for others, especially to weep for our supposed enemies, that, that makes us divine. That's godlike. Joseph's tears confirm a deep humanity within. His tears proved to be a balm of healing. I think Mother Teresa had it right. When she diagnosed the world's ill correctly, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. And because we believe that we are all God's children and that we belong to each other, all divisions and boundaries are illusions. And all wars, no matter where it takes place, is nothing less than family wars. Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies. And I often wonder, perhaps you do the same, how can I possibly love my enemies? Those who've harmed me, hurt me, those who've damaged me. 
And I don't have all the answers for sure, but I think perhaps I know how that journey of reconciliation can begin. Perhaps the only way that journey of reconciliation can begin. In facing his enemies, Joseph recalls their shared story, their mutual destiny, and their common roots. That common roots being their father. And we read in our scripture lesson today that his enemies came near. And Joseph said, I am your brother. I am your sister. We have the same father. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.